a vernacular is a native language or native dialect of a specific population as opposed to a language of wider communication that is a second language or foreign language to the population such as a national language standard language or lingua franca the oldest known vernacular manuscript in Scanian Danish C1250 it deals with Scanian and Scanian ecclesiastical law an allegory of philosophy and grammar, Trenci Palace, Foligno, Italy, by Gentile da Fabriano, who lived at about the time the Italian language was being standardized. Etymology Look up vernacular in Wiktionary, the free dictionary. The term is not a recent one. In 1688 James Howell wrote, Concerning Italy, doubtless there were divers, before the Latin did spread all over that country. The Calabrian and Apulian spoke Greek, whereof some relics are to be found to this day, but it was an adventitious, no mother language, to them. Tis confessed that Latium itself, and all the territories about Rome, had the Latin, for its maternal and common first vernacular tongue. But Tuscany and Liguria had others quite discrepant, the Isi. The Heteroscane and Misapian, whereof though there be some records, yet extant, yet there are none alive that can understand them, the Oscan, the Sabin and Tusculan, are thought to be but dialects. To these. Here vernacular, mother language and dialect are already in use in a modern sense. According to Merriam-Webster's, vernacular was brought into the English language as early as 1601, from Latin vernaculus, native which had been in figurative use in classical Latin, as national and domestic having originally been derived from vernus and vena, a male or female slave respectively born in the house rather than abroad. The figurative meaning was broadened from the diminutive extended words vernaculus, vernacula. Vero, the classical Latin grammarian, used the term vocabula vernacula, terms the la langue nationale or vocabulary of the national language, as opposed to foreign words. In some disciplines, such as linguistic anthropology, the term vernacular is falling out of usage, and has come to be identified as an offensive term. Dialect or dialect variation is more appropriate in context, as the word vernacular comes from the Latin vernaculus domestic, native, which in turn comes from the Etruscan verna home-born slave, native. Thus, the term vernacular is in some ways intrinsically tied to colonialism, and to a lesser extent, slavery, these being why the term is slowly falling out of favor. Concepts of the vernacular General Linguistic Opposed to lingua franca. Allegory of Dante Alighieri, champion of the use of vernacular Italian for literature rather than the lingua franca, Latin. Fresco by Luca Signorelli in the Capella di San Brizio Dome, or Vieto. Ratio of books printed in the vernacular languages to those in Latin, in the 15th century. In general linguistics, a vernacular is opposed to a lingua franca, a third-party language, in which persons speaking different vernaculars not understood by each other may communicate. For instance, in Western Europe, until the 17th century, most scholarly works had been written in Latin, which was serving as a lingua franca. Works written in Romance languages are said to be in the vernacular, the Divina Commedia, the Cantard Myosid, and the Song of Roland are examples of early vernacular literature in Italian, Spanish, and French, respectively. In Europe, Latin was used widely instead of vernacular languages, in varying forms until c. 1701, in its latter stage as New Latin. In religion, Protestantism was a driving force in the use of the vernacular in Christian Europe the Bible being translated from Latin into vernacular languages with such works as the Bible in Dutch, published in 1526, by Jacob van Lysfeldt, Bible in French, published in 1528, by Jacques Lefebvre at Les, or Faber Stoppelensis, German Luther Bible, in 1534, New Testament 1522, Bible in Spanish, published in Basel in 1569, by Cassio Doro de Reina, Biblia del Oso, Bible in Czech, Bible of Kralis, printed between 1579 and 1593, Bible in English, King James Bible, published in 1611.
in Catholicism, vernacular Bibles were later provided, but Latin was used at Trident in Mass, until the Second Vatican Council of 1965. Certain groups, notably traditionalist Catholics, continue to practice Latin Mass. In India, the 12th century Bhakti movement led to the translation of Sanskrit texts to the vernacular. In science, an early user of the vernacular was Galileo, writing in Italian c. 1600, though some of his works remained in Latin. A later example is Isaac Newton, whose 1687 Principia was in Latin, but whose 1704 Optics was in English. Latin continues to be used in certain fields of science, notably binomial nomenclature and biology, while other fields such as mathematics use vernacular, see scientific nomenclature for details. In diplomacy, French displaced Latin in Europe, in the 1710s, due to the military power of Louis XIV of France. Certain languages have both a classical form and various vernacular forms, with two widely used examples being Arabic and Chinese, see varieties of Arabic and Chinese language. In the 1920s, due to the May Fourth Movement, classical Chinese was replaced by written vernacular Chinese. For more details on this topic, see vernacular literature. A low variant in diglossia. The vernacular is also often contrasted with a liturgical language, a specialized use of a former lingua franca. For example, until the 1960s, Latin Rite Roman Catholics held masses in Latin rather than in vernaculars. To this day the Coptic Church holds liturgies in Coptic, not Arabic. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church holds liturgies in GE apostrophe easy, though parts of Mass are read in Amharic. Similarly, in Hindu culture, traditionally religious or scholarly works were written in Sanskrit, long after its use as a spoken language, or in Tamil and Tamil country. Sanskrit was a lingua franca among the non-Indo-European languages of the Indian subcontinent, and became more of one as the spoken language, or Prakrits, began to diverge from it in different regions. With the rise of the Bhakti movement, from the 12th century onwards, religious works were created in the other languages, Hindi, Kannada, Telugu, and many others. For example, the Ramayana, one of Hinduism's sacred epics in Sanskrit, had vernacular versions such as Ranjanata Ramayanam composed in Telugu by Gona Buddha Reddy, in the 15th century, and Ramachari Tamanasa, a Hindi version of the Ramayana, by the 16th century poet Tulsidas. These circumstances are a contrast between a vernacular and language variant used by the same speakers. According to one school of linguistic thought, all such variants are examples of a linguistic phenomenon termed diglossia, split tongue, on the model of the genetic anomaly. In it, the language is bifurcated, i.e., the speaker learns two forms of the language, and ordinarily uses one, but, under special circumstances the other. The one most frequently used is the low, L, variant, equivalent to the vernacular, while the special variant is the high, H. The concept was introduced to linguistics by Charles A. Ferguson, 1959, but Ferguson explicitly excluded variants as divergent as dialects, or different languages, or as similar as tiles or registers. H must not be a conversational form, Ferguson had in mind a literary language. For example, a lecture is delivered in a different variety than ordinary conversation. Ferguson's own example was classical and spoken Arabic, but the analogy between vulgar Latin and classical Latin is of the same type. Excluding the upper class and lower class register aspects of the two variants, classical Latin was a literary language, the people spoke vulgar Latin, as a vernacular. Joshua Fishman redefined the concept in 1964, to include everything Ferguson had excluded. Fishman allowed both different languages and dialects and also different styles and registers, as the H variants. The essential contrast between them was that they be functionally differentiated that is, H must be used for special purposes, such as a liturgical or sacred language. Faisald expanded the concept still further by proposing that multiple H exist in society from which the users can select for various purposes. The definition of an H is intermediate between Ferguson's and Fishman's. 
realizing the inappropriateness of the term diglossia, only to, to his concept, he proposes the term broad diglossia. Sociolinguistic Within the subcategory of sociolinguistics, the term vernacular has been applied to several concepts. Unfortunately, it is only possible to identify which is meant in an authored work by context. An informal register. In variation theory, pioneered by William Leibov, language is a large set of styles or registers, from which the speaker selects according to the social setting of the moment. The vernacular is the least self-conscious style of people in a relaxed conversation, or the most basic style that is, casual varieties used spontaneously rather than self-consciously, informal talk used in intimate situations. In other contexts the speaker does conscious work to select the appropriate variations. The one he can use without this effort is the first form of speech acquired. A non-standard dialect in another theory, the vernacular is opposed to the standard. The non-standard varieties thus defined are dialects, which are to be identified as complexes of factors, social class, region, ethnicity, situation, and so forth. Both the standard and the non-standard language have dialects, but in contrast to the standard, the non-standard have socially disfavored structures. The standard are primarily written, but the non-standard are spoken. An example of a vernacular dialect is African American vernacular English, an idealization. A vernacular is not a real language, but is an abstract set of norms. First Vernacular Grammars Through metalinguistic publications vernaculars acquired the status of official languages. Between 1437 and 1586 the first grammars of Italian, Spanish, French, Dutch, German, and English were written, though not always immediately published. It is to be understood that the first vestiges of those languages preceded their standardization by up to several hundred years. Irish Grammar or a Sepenaeanesis is a grammar of the Irish language which is thought to date back as far as the 7th century. The earliest surviving manuscripts are 12th century. Welsh Grammar The so-called grammar books of the master poets, W. Gramadeg and Pincer Diod, are considered to have been composed in the early 14th century, and are present in manuscripts from soon after. These tracts draw on the traditions of the Latin grammars of Donatus and Priscianus, and also on the teaching of the professional Welsh poets. The tradition of grammars of the Welsh language developed from these through the Middle Ages and to the Renaissance. Italian Grammar Italian appears before standardization as the lingua italica of Isidore and the lingua vulgaris of subsequent medieval writers. Documents of mixed Latin and Italian are known from the 12th century, which appears to be the start of writing in Italian. The first known grammar of a Romance language was a book written in manuscript form by Leon Battista Alberti, between 1437 and 1441 and entitled Grammatica della lingua Toscana, Grammar, of the Tuscan language and it Alberti sought to demonstrate that the vernacular here Tuscan, known today as modern Italian was every bit as structured as Latin, he did so by mapping vernacular structures onto Latin. The book was never printed until 1908. It was not generally known, but it was known as an inventory of the library of Lorenzo di apostrophe medic illicit under the title Regul Lingua Florentine, Rules of the Florentine Language. The only known manuscript copy, however, is included in the Codex, Regan in Zilatino 1370, located at Rome, in the Vatican Library. It is therefore called the Grammaticetta Vaticana. More influential perhaps were the 1516 Regal Grammaticale della Valgar Lingua of Giovanni Francesco Fortunio, and the 1525 Prose della Valgar Lingua of Pietro Bembo. In those works the author strove to establish a dialect that would qualify for becoming the Italian national language. For more details on this topic, see Italian language. Spanish Grammar Spanish, more accurately La Lingua Castellana, has a development chronologically similar to that of Italian, some vocabulary and Isidore of Seville, traces afterward, writing from about the 12th century, standardization beginning. 
in the 15th century, coincident with the rise of Castile as an international power. The first Spanish grammar by Antonio de Nebrija, Tratado de Gramática sobre la Lengua Castellana, 1492, was divided in two parts for native and non-native speakers, pursuing a different purpose in each. Books 1-4 describe the Spanish language grammatically in order to facilitate the study of Latin for its Spanish-speaking readers. Book 5 contains a phonetical and morphological overview of Spanish for non-native speakers. For more details on this topic, see History of Spanish. French Grammar French emerged as a Gallo-Romance language from Vulgar Latin in the late antiquity period. The written language is known from at least as early as the 9th century. That language contained many forms still identifiable as Latin. Interest in standardizing French began in the 16th century. Because of the Norman conquest of England, and the Anglo-Norman domains, in both northwestern France and Britain, English scholars retained an interest in the fate of French as well as of English. Some of the numerous 16th-century surviving grammars are as follows. John Paul's Grave, Esclarci Sonon de la Langue Francoise, in English, 1530. For more details on this topic, see Old French. German Grammar the development of the standard German was impeded by political disunity and strong local traditions until the invention of printing made possible a high German-based book language. This literary language was not identical to any specific variety of German. The first grammar evolved from pedagogical works that also tried to create a uniform standard from the many regional dialects for various reasons. Religious leaders wished to create a sacred language for Protestantism that would be parallel to the use of Latin for the Roman Catholic Church. Various administrations wished to create a civil service or chancery language that would be useful in more than one locality. And finally, nationalists wished to counter the spread of the French national language in two German-speaking territories assisted by the efforts of the French Academy. With so many linguists moving in the same direction as Standard German, Hochdutz Schriftspreche did evolve without the assistance of a language academy. Its precise origin, the major constituents of its features, remains uncertainly known and debatable. Latin prevailed as a lingua franca until the 17th century, when grammarians began to debate the creation of an ideal language. Before 1550, as a conventional date supra-regional compromises were used in printed works, such as the one published by Valand and Nichols Amer, Ein Teutsche Grammatica, 1534. Books published in one of these artificial variants began to increase in frequency replacing the Latin then in use. After 1550 the supra-regional ideal brought into a universal intent to create a national language from early New High German by deliberately ignoring regional forms of speech, which practice was considered to be a form of purification parallel to the ideal of purifying religion in Protestantism. In 1617 the Fruit Bearing Society, a language club, was formed in Weimar in imitation of the Academia della Crusca in Italy. It was one of many such clubs, however, none became a national academy. In 1618-1619 Johannes Cromer wrote the first All-German Grammar. In 1641 Justin George Schottel and Utschsprockens presented the standard language as an artificial one. By the time of his work of 1663, Osferli Scharb by von der Teutsch and Hauptsprache, the standard language was well established. For more details on this topic, see History of German. Dutch Grammar A sermon of 1275 at Bibertholt von Regensburg made the earliest known distinction between the speech of the Niederländer and that of the Oberländer. The Niederländer, or speakers of Low German, were anyone living in the lowlands from the Baltic Sea to the Netherlands, while the Oberländer, who spoke High German, lived in more elevated terrain. The first known such distinction was made in Dutch Low German variant, in a printed book of 1482, which mentioned Nederlandsch and Oberlandsch Sprache, still with the same ranges. With the meaning of Niederduitsch and Hagenuitsch. Martin Luther, however, a generation later, used Niederländer 
to mean the population of the Burgundian Netherlands, a small state consisting of several lowland counties ruled by the Duke of Burgundy, since its creation by Charles the Bald of the Holy Roman Empire in 843. By that time also northern Germany was using Dudesh for their variant, as opposed to Duitsch in the Low Countries. The southerners referred to their speech as Dietesch. In the 16th century, while Martin Luther was working out a compromise high German for his translation of the Bible, the so-called Rhetorich Kurskamers, Chambers of Rhetoric, learned literary societies founded throughout Flanders and Holland, from the 1420s onward, first attempted to impose a Latin structure on Dutch, on the presumption that Latin grammar had a universal character. However in 1559 Jan van den Werve published his grammar dense Kater Deitzertalen in Dutch, and so did Dirk Volkert Zone Kornhert, in a new NABC of Materi Beck, in 1564. The Latinizing tendency changed course with the joint publication in 1584 by De Aglantier, the Rhetoric Society of Amsterdam, of the first comprehensive Dutch grammar, Twees Praat van den Eter Duitsche Letterkund slash OFTE van Spellen in Die Gens Cap des Netter Duitschentals. Hendrik Lorenz Oan Spiegel was a major contributor but others contributed as well. For more details on this topic, see History of Dutch. English Grammar Modern English is considered to have begun at a conventional date of about 1550, most notably at the end of the Great Vowel Shift, for example, but, the footwear, more, as in boat to boot, clarification needed. It was created by the infusion of Old French into Old English, after the Norman conquest of 1066 ad, and of Latin, at the instigation of the clerical administration. While modern English-speaking students may be able to read Middle English authors such as Chaucer in secondary school with schooling, Old English is much more difficult. Middle English is known for its alternative spellings and pronunciations. The British Isles, although geographically limited, have always supported populations of widely variant dialects, as well as a few different languages. Being the language of a maritime power, English was of necessity formed from elements of many different languages. Standardization has been an ongoing issue. Even in the age of modern communications and mass media, according to one study. Although the received pronunciation of standard English has been heard constantly on radio and then television, for over 60 years, only 3 to 5 percent of the population of Britain actually speaks RP. New brands of English have been springing up even in recent times. What the vernacular would be in this case is a moot point. The standardization of English has been in progress for many centuries. Modern English came into being as the standard Middle English, that is, the preferred dialect of the king, his court, and administration. That dialect was East Midland, which had spread to London, where the king resided, and from which he ruled. It contained Danish forms not often used in the north or south, as the Danes had settled heavily in the Midlands. Chaucer wrote in an early East Midland, Wycliffe translated the New Testament into it and William Caxton, the first English printer, wrote in it. Caxton is considered the first modern English author. The first printed book in England was Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, published by Caxton, in 1476. The first English grammars were written in Latin, with some in French. After a general plea for mother tongue education in England, the first part of the elementary, published in 1582, by Richard Mulcaster, William Bulacar wrote the first English grammar, to be written in English, pamphlet for grammar, followed by ref grammar, both in 1586. Previously he had written book at large, for the amendment of orthography for English speech, 1580, but his orthography was not generally accepted, and was soon supplanted, and his grammar shared a similar fate. Other grammars in English followed rapidly, Paul Greaves' Grammatica Anglicana, 1594, Alexander Hume's Orthography and Congruity of the Briton Tongue, 1617, and many others. Over the succeeding decades many literary figures turned a hand to grammar in English, Alexander Gill, Ben Johnson, Joshua Poole, John Wallace, Jeremiah Warden, James Howell, Thomas Lye. Christopher Cooper, William Lilly, John Collette, 
and so on, all leading to the massive dictionary of Samuel Johnson. For more details on this topic, see History of English. First Vernacular Dictionaries A dictionary is to be distinguished from a glossary. Although numerous glossaries publishing vernacular words had long been in existence, such as the Etymologie of Isidore of Seville, which listed many Spanish words, the first vernacular dictionaries emerged together with vernacular grammars. Italian In the early 15th century a number of glossaries appeared, such as that of Lucillo Miner beyond Boccaccio, in 1535, and those of Fabrizio Luna on Ariosto, Petrarca, Boccaccio, and Dante, in 1536. In the mid-16th the dictionaries began, as listed below. In 1582 the first language academy was formed, called Academia della Crusca, brand academy which sifted language like rain. Once formed, its publications were standard setting. Monolingual Alberto Acaricio, Vocabolario, e Grammatica con Ortografia della Lingua Vulgare. 1543. Francesco Aluno, Li Riches della Lingua Vulgare, 1543. Francesco Aluno, La Fabrica del Mundo, 1548. Giacomo Pergamini, Il Mimo Reale della Lingua Italiana, 1602. Accademia della Crusca, Vocabolario degli Accademici della Crusca, 1612. Italian slash French. Nathaniel Duyez, de Tionario Italiano e Francis slash Dictel en Ire de Leonet Francois Leiden, 1559-1560. Gabriel Pannonius, Petit Vocabulaire en Lang Franca is et Italian, Lyon, 1578. Jean Antoine Thanis, Dictel en Ire Francois et Italien, Paris, 1584. Italian slash English. John Florio, A World of Words, London, 1598. John Florio, Queen Anna's New World of Words, London, 1611. Italian slash Spanish. Cristobal de las Casas, Vocabulario de las dos lenguas de Scana y Castellana, Sevilla, 1570. Lorenzo Franciacini, Vocabulario Italiano e Spagnolo slash Vocabulario Espanoli Italiano, Roma, 1620. Spanish. The first Spanish dictionaries in the 15th century were Latin Spanish slash Spanish Latin, followed by monolingual Spanish. In 1713 the Real Academia Española, Royal Spanish Academy, was founded to set standards. It published an official dictionary, 1726-1739. Alonso de Palencia, El Universal Vocabulario in Latin y Romance, 1490. Antonio de Nebrija, Lexicon Latino Hispanicum et Hispanico Latinum, 1492. Sebastian de Covarrubioso Rosco, Tesoro de la Lengua Castellano Española, 1611. Real Academia Española, Decionario, de la Lengua Castellana, 1726-1739. French. Surviving dictionaries are a century earlier than their grammars. The Academy Francaise founded in 1635 was given the obligation of producing a standard dictionary. Some early dictionaries are Louis Cruz, alias Garbin, Dictionnaire Latin France Wa, 1487. Robert Estienne, alias Robertus Stephanus, Dicta on Irie France Wa Latin, 1539. Maurice de la Porte, Epitheta, 1571. G. Nico, Thresar de la Langue Fracois, Tan Tan Chen Cumadern, 1606. Pierre Richelet. Dicta on Irie Francois Contenant at Lamos, at Les Choses, 1680. Academie Francaise, Dicta on Ira de l'Académie Francaise, 1694, and subsequently. German. High German dictionaries began in the 16th century, and were at first multilingual. They were preceded by glossaries of German words and phrases, on various specialized topics. 
Finally interest in developing a vernacular German grew to the point where Mahler could publish a work called by Jacob Grimm the first truly German dictionary. Joshua Mahler, Die Deutsche Sprache, Dictionary in Germanico Latinum Novum, 1561. It was followed along similar lines by George Heinisch, Deutsche Sprache und die Weihheit, 1616. After numerous dictionaries and glossaries of a less than comprehensive nature came a thesaurus that attempted to include all German. Kaspar Steeler, Der Teutschen Sprache Stammbaum und die Fort Wach so Der Teutschen Sprache Schatz, 1691. And finally the first codification of written German. Johann Christoph Edelin. Verzuck eins vollständig und grammatisch kritisch in Waterbuches der Hochdeutschen Mundert, 1774-1786. Schiller called Dad Lung and Ulrakel and Willen is said to have nailed a copy to his desk. Dutch. Glossaries in Dutch began about 1470 ad leading eventually to two Dutch dictionaries. Christoph Planten, Thesaurus de Tony Collingway, 1573. Cornelis Killion, Dictionarium Teutonico Latinum, 1574, becoming Etymologicum, with the 1599 third edition. Shortly after, 1579, the southern Netherlands came under the dominion of Spain, then of Austria, 1713, and of France, 1794. The Congress of Vienna created the United Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1815, from which Southern Netherlands, being Catholic, seceded in 1830 to form the Kingdom of Belgium, which was confirmed in 1839 by the Treaty of London. As a result of this political instability no standard Dutch was defined, even though much in demand, and recommended as an ideal until after World War II. Currently the Dutch Language Union, an international treaty organization founded in 1980, supports a standard Dutch in the Netherlands, while Afrikaans is regulated by Dital Commissie founded in 1909. English Standard English remains a quasi-fictional ideal, despite the numerous private organizations publishing prescriptive rules for it. No language academy was ever established or espoused by any government past or present in the English-speaking world. In practice the British monarchy and its administrations established an ideal of what good English should be considered to be, and this in turn was based on the teachings of the major universities, such as Cambridge University and Oxford University, which relied on the scholars whom they hired. There is a general but far from uniform consensus among the leading scholars about what should or should not be said in standard English, but for every rule examples from famous English writers can be found that break it. Uniformity of spoken English never existed and does not exist now, but usages do exist, which must be learned by the speakers and do not conform to prescriptive rules. Usages have been documented not by prescriptive grammars, which on the whole are less comprehensible to the general public, but by comprehensive dictionaries, often termed unabridged, which attempt to list all usages of words, and the phrases in which they occur as well, as the date of first use, and the etymology, where possible. These typically require many volumes, and yet not more so than the unabridged dictionaries of many languages. Bilingual dictionaries and glossaries precede modern English and were in use in the earliest written English. The first monolingual dictionary was Robert Caldry, Table Law for Bedical, 1604, which was followed by a larger one. Edward Phillips, A New World of English Words, 1658. Nathaniel Bailey, An Universal Etymological English Dictionary, 1721. These dictionaries whetted the interest of the English-speaking public in greater and more prescriptive dictionaries, until Samuel Johnson published a grand design for such a one. Samuel Johnson, Plan of a Dictionary, of the English Language, 1747, which would imitate the dictionary being produced by the French Academy. He had no problem acquiring the funding, but not as a prescriptive dictionary. This was to be a grand comprehensive dictionary of all English words, at any period. 
Samuel Johnson, A Dictionary of the English Language, 1755. By 1858 the need for an update resulted in the first planning for a new comprehensive dictionary, which would document standard English, a term coined at that time by the planning committee. The dictionary, known as the Oxford English Dictionary, published its first fascicle in 1884. It attracted significant contributions from some singular minds, such as William Chester Minor, a former army surgeon, who had become criminally insane and made most of his contributions, while incarcerated. Whether the OED is the long-desired standard English dictionary is debatable, but its authority is taken seriously by the entire English-speaking world. Its staff is currently working on a third edition.